Welcome to the Clear to Send podcast, a podcast about wireless engineering, where we educate you on Wi-Fi technology, talk about design tips, troubleshooting, interviews, and the tools. Here are your hosts, Roel and Francois. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Clear to Send podcast. It's been a couple weeks and... Uh, we went on vacation for a bit. I uh, actually traveled to uh, Toronto, Canada, and you know, Francois is here on uh, co-hosting as well. How are you doing, Francois? I'm good, very good. Uh, it was very nice meeting you in person, finally, yeah, after all we, of this time. Yeah, it's funny because uh, we've never met in person until I went to Toronto uh, first week of October, or second week of October. I don't October. know what took you so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my first time out there, so... It, it took a while, actually, for me to get to Toronto. I had all sorts of issues with flying. And all that. But it was great to finally meet you and also your family. Our, both of our families met up for dinner, and that was great. It was awesome. Yeah, our kids, it was, uh, was kind of late, so our kids were all at that stage where they wanted to go to sleep. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's funny enough that we each have a daughter born on the same month. Yeah, and that was so. that was a uh, something we discovered when we met up. We were very close in, in in birthdays, and actually close to my birthday too. I'm a January uh, uh, person. Okay, but yeah, it was great to see you and uh, our kids. Uh, I guess liked each other. They 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 played for a little bit, but not too much. And it was it was yeah, evening. They were tired. Yeah, and you guys just drove uh, for quite a quite a distance to go to Toronto as well. Yeah. It's always the traffic in Toronto, but you know, you know it's the, tra- okay. the traffic's not as bad as Bay Area, I don't think. But I, I, it was great to be in Canada. It's very different from the West Coast in California, and I will say it was very clean. And you know, the one thing that I noticed in Toronto are the the cellular antennas on all the different buildings everywhere. That's different yeah. from from California, where they want to keep those hidden a bit or use fake trees and put antennas there. But I was very surprised to see so many cell antennas all over the place. Did you get good uh, coverage? I got good coverage, but I would say the quality of my signal was not very good. And I don't know if that has to do with me coming over from Verizon and then using the carriers there with Rogers and uh, forgot the other ones. I know I was on Rogers the most, but it, it was okay, yeah. to say the least, but it was kind of good Sometimes to stay a little disconnected. Antennas, and they don't really hide them. Yeah, they I just guess. put them on the roofs of, of several buildings, and they're, they're those sector antennas, and um, they're on mounts, and they just all over the side, the, the roofs of different buildings, they're pointed in every which direction. So maybe it's just too many sector antennas. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like the stuff you don't notice after you know living here for a while. <laughs> yeah, you just get used to it, right? Um, but yeah, it was good. Yeah, it, I thought it was just interesting to see, and and maybe one day we'll talk about you know, doing some of that outdoor stuff. Um, not maybe cell signal, but maybe wireless signal outdoors. But in this episode, yeah. we want to talk about the latest uh, vulnerability that came out for Wi-Fi security, and that's the crack attack. And that got released uh, earlier October, I think October Monday 16th. on Monday, I believe, yeah. yeah. And it was released by a security researcher. His name is Matt, Matthew Van Hoof. Probably butchered that one, but he discovered this this vulnerability crack, which is just an acronym for key reinstallation attack, and it's a a, a method of breaking WPA2 security by forcing non uh, reuse. What do you think about that, Francois? Um, well, he was, you know, he got a lot of attention. Oh yeah, he sure did. A lot of press. Uh, yeah, a lot of fuss, a lot of um uh, even he got even to the like the general media, right? Oh yeah. So that's how that's how you know it's it's kind of a big deal. Um, so I think it's important to just, um, it's important for us as Wi-Fi engineers to get, you know, more information about it and uh, know actually what it is and what it takes to, uh, to perform such an attack, uh, just to, just to know if it's a big deal for, you know, our enterprise networks or our home networks. 
Right. And I think if, if people had gone to his website, which is crackattacks.com, and that's with a K, they would have seen right away, it says, by forcing nonce reuse. And so right away, people in the media probably don't even know what that means, how that affects them. But all they know is WPA2 is, quote unquote, broken uh, by how a lot of media put that. But I don't think that's necessarily the case, right? Because it doesn't really break, completely break the security because it's really targeting um, the four-way handshake. Uh, and the four way yeah. handshake within the the security of WPA2, and these are the different exchanges between a device and the access point. And there are ten CVEs that that he lists out, and nine of them apply to the devices, and one of them applies to access points. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, like uh, WPA2 is is not broken, right? There's no. Like to me, WPA2 would be broken if you're able to decrypt all of the traffic going through. Yeah, and that's right? the thing. We a lot of media sites are saying, "Oh, your traffic is now going to your your sensitive information is now going to be seen by attackers," but not necessarily so, right? Yeah. So what happens here if you're able to uh, pull off the attack? You'll be able to decrypt the uh, the first few packets that has been, um, you know encrypted using the same uh, keep stream so it's not going to be the full communication it's going to be the first uh few packets sent by the clients right usually mm-hmm. it's arp uh, dhcp uh might be a beginning of a tcp uh, uh session and then you could you could use that to uh, to use other attacks to attack like a tcp session or something right yeah and it's it, it, we, we want to reemphasize it's attacking the four-way handshake because that's what is required to make this work. Now, there are four messages within the four-way handshake. Obviously, that's why it's called four-way handshake. And the first two of those, uh, the first two messages of the four-way handshake are to create those nonce, the nonces the, uh, from the authenticator and also the client side. And if you do a frame capture of, let's say, your home network, you're using WPA2, and you're using PSK, if you capture some frames on the same channel of your device that associates to the AP, you will see those four messages come across the wire or come across the Wi-Fi. And then it is message number three in which the crack attack focuses on. And that's how it does its uh, reinstallation attack. But first... Let's talk about how it even gets to message number three, right? Because I think this attack is complicated. It's not very easy to pull off. So for the client side, because most it's pretty much the clients that are affected, there needs to be a man-in-the-middle attack first, right, Francois? Yeah, so basically the attack is focusing on the third message of the four-way four-way handshake. And I think what's important to know at this point is that the, the four-way handshake is the very last bit that's happening uh, when the client connects to a WPA network, uh, just before getting online and, and start sending data, encrypted data, right? So the four-way handshake is the very last piece. Before that, you have all of the authentication, right? So whether you use PSK or whether you use 802.11.1x, everything, all the authentication is happening before the four-way handshake. Mm-hmm. Right. So here we're only focusing on the very end. And this is why, you know, it's affecting most of the clients. Most of the there, clients. Yeah. We, Cause it's the we, message that goes yeah. back to the client and it's where yeah. you install your, your PTK, which is the pairwise transient key. And, and that's where it's, that's the attack is it's forcing the reinstallation of that key. Yeah, and like you said, you need a man in the middle in order to stop. Uh, so basically, what the man in the middle would do it would just stop the uh, um, the uh, message from the um, uh, from the clients, and then resend the message to re from the AP, forcing the client to reinstall the key. Yeah, and basically, you got to get this client to join your uh, the the attacker's uh, spoofed network, which is it's going to spoof an AP and trick a client into thinking that it needs to join that, that, that it's part of that AP's connection, right? So when the client's speaking, it's the, the man in the middle attack, the, cl- the attacker is going to let those first two messages go through. 
and then it's going to yeah, so, prevent that third message. Yeah, so in order, yeah, like I said, in order for the mind the middle attack to be successful, in the the fake AP, I would call it the fake AP, the one in the middle would have to be close enough, close enough to the client for the client to uh, connect to this fa- fake AP versus connecting to the real AP. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the attacker will have to physically be close to the um, you know the client. Yeah, and that's where I see it as gonna as it's a complicated attack because you should be able to see somebody in the vicinity that probably shouldn't even be there, right? If they're trying to do some sort of attack, if this is in your office, I, I think maybe this would be more prevalent in a public space. Like, let's say somebody targeting a very specific person that could be you know, at Starbucks and they're using their phone to check messages for some whatever reason. I, I would see yeah. that being more easily of a target are the people in public wi- using public Wi-Fi if that public Wi-Fi is even encrypted. Yeah, most of the time public Wi-Fi is open with a captive portal, right? Uh, but like you said, yeah, the, the, even if the attacker is like close to the client and is doing everything possible to, um, you know, to be as close as possible, sometimes the client will just decide to connect to some another AP, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. So the, the attacker doesn't control uh, the client's behavior. Yeah. So, so those are, I think that's where the biggest problem is, is going to be the client side. Cause the clients need to be updated, uh, with a security patch to basically prevent the reinstallation of this, of this in a uh, key that was already in use. And so with that patch, it's just not going to allow another, the, the same key to be reinstalled again on the client side. And those are all, yeah out of the 10 CVEs, nine of them focus on the client side. Yeah. So it sounds easy. Yeah. Just yeah. patch all your clients. Just patch them all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that means we got to touch a lot of these devices. So if you're in an environment where BYOD is your biggest environment, right? Like a campus environment, you don't control the, 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 the patches that get pushed to these devices. So, uh, it's it's kind of a tough one to to pull, but I guess you could um, find different ways to see if a client is vulnerable to that. Uh, but yeah, one one of these yeah. things is that we must always keep our devices patched, especially if it's just security patches. I mean, you don't have to install every single update, but if it's a security update, you should apply that. And a lot of these vendors are coming out with their their updates. Windows has already released an update for their clients, and they actually patch that vulnerability i think two weeks before this um this was released out to the public yeah they released i I believe they released it in july to the vendors Mm, okay so so it gave it gave the vendors some time to develop patches and 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 such um so i'm going to take the example of aruba because aruba had their version pat the patch version like ready five days before it went public yeah and this is the the infrastructure side the ap side because the the vulnerable part on the ap's from the ap's point of view is the uh, fast transition and there is no man in the middle attack needed for this vulnerability they're just going to um basically uh what is it reinstall that key yeah through j- just sending the message out there. Replay, a replay attack. A replay I mean, attack. You're just resending the same packets uh, over again to the client. And then depending on how they react, you might be able to create a breach. Yeah, and even then, I still think that's uh, a difficult feat to, to pull off. But there is a workaround to that. If you don't have a patch or you can't update for some reason, apply the security update, you could just turn off 802.11r for the time being. Um, but most of these vendors are already coming out. Uh, Meraki has came out with an update. So if you got automatic updates, that will be patched. Aruba, like Francois said, there's already an update. Cisco released one just a day ago with um, 8.3.132. And I think the other trains are going to come out in the future. And that's where I'm most surprised is that maybe Cisco didn't get this information ahead of time. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm surprised too. I was expecting them to be uh, faster on the reply uh, and provide the the patch, fa- you know, faster for their customers. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is I was looking at this the release notes today, and I know because initially the 
the patch for Cisco was 8.3.131. And then for some reason today, it's .132. So they had pulled the, the original patch. I don't know, for whatever reason, they they pulled it. And now it's .132. And if you're still running 8.3, that's the patch you could install to, to uh, fix this security vulnerability. So what is the fix, really? <laughs> because... Uh, the, yeah. the media makes it seem like security is broken for Wi-Fi, but it's not. It's not completely broken. There is just a vulnerability that targets key exchanges, which can be fixed. And yeah. if we, we need manage to, to prevent the client or the AP to mm-hmm. reinstall already in use keys, you fix the issue, right? And so, like you said, that's something that can be fixed by the way WPA is implemented. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the Wi-Fi drivers and on the APs themselves. So if you're able to patch those clients, uh, you're able to fix the issue. Yeah. Um, so like so we said, I don't it's think easy it's... to say I'm going to patch my clients. Some clients are going to be hard to patch. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, some vendors might not be around anymore or some vendors are not working on the patch. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe some IoT devices will never get patched. Yeah, and that's the scary part right. is it, it becomes a bigger issue, right? It's not just because of this specific vulnerability because, you know, like if you're re- – one of the questions is going to be, well, if – let's say the, the, the refrigerator has a Wi-Fi, car, Wi-Fi card in there and it's vulnerable, what is an attacker really going to gain from <laughs> – from hacking that device or hacking the doing a man in the middle with that device. But the bigger issue is how we do security for devices that are all going to join Wi-Fi. And if you don't control security updates for these devices, who do we look to in order to make sure these security updates are released in a timely fashion and easily installed on all of these devices? So that way your network is secure. Because I think that's the bigger problem. It's it, I think it's easy for organizations to patch their own infrastructure. You know, your wireless LAN controllers, your APs, those are easy to patch because you control those. those yeah. That's that's in your realm in your vicinity that you can easily patch, and you can hold vendors accountable to that, especially these big vendors because this is what we use day in and day out. But for someone carrying you know that IoT device with them or some phone that just never gets patched, what do we do in that case? And I think maybe we could use something like an intrusion detection system. I know there's signatures out there. Some vendors have created signatures to try to even find um, if someone is spoofing your your uh, BSSID and trying to do a man-in-the-middle attack. I mean, that's just one layer of doing security. Yeah, I've I've uh, tried it on Aruba this week. They actually came out, someone on Twitter came out with the code that you could implement in order for the IDS, the built-in IDS into the, the oh, built-in okay. controller to um uh, to detect uh, the spoofing and the uh, the mic the you know the attack the man in the middle attack. Yeah. Yeah, that's I think that's something that should be implemented into all of our wireless LAN controllers or into all of our uh, whatever infrastructure we're using for Wi-Fi, because it, it, if we're going to be deploying Wi-Fi out there for people to use, I think they actually require us to be the ones to secure it, right? If someone's going to use Wi-Fi, they expect us to secure it. And I think having something that would create sign something that has signatures to detect whether somebody is doing a man in the middle attack with your SSID, I think that is highly beneficial and i think security is just one of those overlooked things with wi-fi yeah that's definitely something we should uh, at least at least you know report and send send uh, an alert about uh some vendors go even further and and prevent the uh contain the clients right prevent the, the clients to talk to this fake ap yeah because it's maybe not an authorized ap in the environment so therefore it would send something like the auth attacks or the auth yeah. frame so you don't join that uh, yeah, BSSID, exactly. or yeah. if if it's on the network, right? If that device is attached to the network, there are ways for within the infrastructure to even just shut down that port of that rogue device that might be spoofing your 
your SSID. Yeah. Yeah, you can set up rules. I know in, uh, in Cisco, you can set up rules and say, okay, if, uh, you know, an AP is detected broadcasting my SSID, but it's not one of my APs, you can, you know, send an alert or a contain or something. Yep. And, and I think also as another way to prevent some of these security issues, let's say your device isn't patched for this crack attack. As long as your communications is using secure communications, right? Like HTTPS or you're using yeah. a VPN, as long as your information is not sent in the clear text, even if there was some sort of attack where someone can get your traffic, because, you know, to wireless, you can sniff all these frames. Even if someone were to do that, at least it's encrypted by other means, right? There's there's the encryption of traffic between your device and the AP, but then you also encrypt your traffic between your device and whatever the destination application or server is. Yes, exactly. Uh, like you said, if we're trying to take a step back, uh, we're talking about something that's happening layer two, right? But after that, depending on the application you're using, you might have other security and mechanism involved in the protocol you use. Yeah, and right? and some of that will be questionable because of the apps we use on our devices. We have like Android and iPhone where we have these apps that we install. How do we know they're not sending our information in the clear text? I mean, they're the only other the only way to figure that out is to actually do a packet sniff and see whether or not that application is sent using secure is sending data over secure communications. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm thinking maybe like VPNs are going to become more and more uh, popular as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always maybe use VPN gonna, okay, out okay, in the public. VPN on all my personal mobile devices, uh, even if we're using WPA. Uh, just as a you know, a second layer of security. Yeah, and that's why I think security should be done in layers. You don't fully rely on that one, you know, mechanism for security. Don't fully rely on WPA2 pre-shared key to completely encrypt everything, uh, all your communications. You should have a layered approach. Uh, you know, something besides a firewall. Also have intrusion detection systems that can you know, look at your traffic and report on something that's that looks like an anomaly on the network. So we have to take layered approaches, even on our laptops, have um, host based applications that help secure our operating systems. Yeah, that's easy if you have powerful machines, right? But let's say we're talking about I IoT devices that might not be powerful enough to have, you know, a VPN client or, you know, anything else more than what they what they do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's why there's such a big threat um, on the network. And because we don't control them, we don't have insight into those devices. I think w if more attacks like this come out, it's going to start changing how we do security, how we deploy Wi Fi for these devices. Like, I'm sure people are doing separate SSIDs just for IoT devices. I mean, yeah. you've, got, you've got door locks that are wireless only. People like doing those because they don't have to run wires anymore to these doors. They just want to be able to lock and unlock them wirelessly. But again, that communication is done over Wi-Fi. So you want to make sure your Wi-Fi communication is encrypted. You want to make sure that application is sending traffic encrypted. Um, there's a whole slew of things that could go wrong over Wi-Fi just because that signal travels quite the distance and anyone can be able to sniff those frames. So uh, do you think it's the end of Wi-Fi? No, I think it's only going to, everything's just going to go Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to ask you, do you think it's the end of WPA2? I don't think it is. So let's, let's try to uh, answer some questions that people might have, right? People might say, okay, do yeah. I need to change my pre shared key password? No, that doesn't solve the issue here because we're talking about four-way handshakes, uh, layer two. This has nothing to do with a password. Um, will will the attacker see the password, Francois? If you're using a pre shared key, well, do you do you Can think you the, that again? Do you think the attacker will see your password, your PSK? No, no, the attack is not. Uh, uh, it doesn't reveal the password. The only way for the attacker to find out the password is if you have a very weak password and he's doing a brute force attack 
or a dictionary attack. And it's basically trying a whole bunch of passwords until it succeeds. Yep. And if you and have an intrusion detection password. system, you might be able to see that there's a device doing a brute force attack, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. What other questions people might have? Do we need WPA3 now? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> but when I think about the IoT and all of these devices, I'm I'm thinking, you know, the security framework we have might not be um, you know, the best mm -hmm. best suited for these type of needs and requirements. So I'm guessing maybe, maybe not WPA three, but we might need something new. Something new for maybe dumb dumber devices. Um devices that don't have a lot of this processing power or feature sets. Uh, and, and maybe we need to hold a lot of these companies accountable for, for building these devices, right? They should be thinking security first. And maybe it's a problem with how they're, they're interpreting the standard. Maybe they interpreted that standard incorrectly and just allowed the reinstallation of that key because the standard simply didn't say don't, don't allow the installation again of the of a key that was already in use. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing they're going to update the standards and make it clear, like less, you know, ambiguous, um, so they don't have these implementation issues in the in the future. And I, I think that's where a lot of the problems we have with devices come from. Anyways, is there there isn't much direction. It's more of a it's the ambiguity of it is people yeah. leaving, leaving room for other people to uh, interpret that with their own with their own exactly words. but when you think about network protocols and and uh, you know attackers and or trying to find a way of vulnerability and of something wrong it's always like you have the people working on the protocols and it's a, it's very straightforward you know you do this and then you do that and then it will do this and then this packet will be sent and so on and then the attackers just try to think out of the box you know what if i send this packet twice what if i send this packet with you know nothing in mm -hmm. it you know and then that's basically how they always find uh the vulner vulnerabilities yeah and th um, those are so the kind of people it's, we it's need. hard for yeah. the ieee to just think about you know how to build a <laughs> protocol and also try to think about okay Securing what if i try it, yeah. to think out, outside of the box and find all of the little think about you know what i mean yeah, the little little details within that language there that might create the hole or the vulnerability. I think that's where they need to focus on in, in future standards is getting getting more security professionals involved in, in creating that standard. But I don't know, maybe they do do that. I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, that's when security is very... Um, that's when it, bec it becomes handy. And I hope like they're going to learn from this and make it uh, better for the next... Um, release or amendment or, or something and it was really nice from uh, uh Matthew mm -hmm. to just publicly uh to privately i mean release it with the vendors first yeah before or you know pre uh, publishing it publicly so vendors had time to they work time on to it and, it, and yeah. fixing what was wrong i agree i think he, yeah he did it the right way and then he had a lot of detail, which will will include links to different resources. But he had, he has a video demonstration of how he you're able to pull off this attack. But he did uh, tell the vendors ahead of time before releasing the information. So he did a great job, and his documentation and his white paper it's it's very detailed and and done very well. And I believe he released the code for his um his attack, so you could replay it in the lab. Yeah, uh, just to make sure you fix the issue. Yeah, right. the, I, ironically, so he had nice. a leak somewhere, and somebody released that information. <laughs> yeah, so somebody did the attack on his own network and found that information. <laughs> well, what yeah. what do you think it's going to do to security? Do you think uh, uh, do you think Wi Fi security will now be more in focus? Do you think you think we'll see a lot more security be brought up and about Wi Fi networks? Oh yeah, for sure. I think it's gonna come up into the discussion now every time. You know, Wi-Fi is gonna be involved designing Wi-Fi. Um, you know, it had. I think it had a huge impact on everyone mm -hmm. in the company. So it's gonna be brought up by directors and managers and such. So um, we just need, need to be 
uh, ready, I yeah. guess, to just uh, present the full picture and then uh, tell them what to do in order to avoid this type of attacks and then tell them the risk and the, you know, give them the full picture. Yeah. And, tell, yeah, and hopefully it's going to, hopefully it's going to lead, this is going to lead to new security standards. Um, and, you know, maybe the IEEE is working on something. Yeah. I'm not sure. sure but, created yeah. some sort of meeting or discussion internally, but yeah, we'll see how this plays out. Maybe security will be a bigger focus now in, in, in Wi-Fi, but this is what we wanted to talk about in today's episode is the, the crack attack and security around Wi-Fi some things that we wanted to talk about were, you know, what, what sh should you be freaking out? And the answer is no, you shouldn't be freaking out. This is not, I don't think this is as big as it's played out to be, uh, especially yeah. on the, in the media side. Uh, and it, media just does that, right? They don't fully understand like key reinstallation attacks, but that's where we come in and we calm everyone down and say, look, it's a complicated attack there's ways to fix this. Here's how you fix it. And we leave it to people to, you know, we give them the solution. They just need to go and act on it. But that's our episode on uh, crack attack and WPA two. Francois, where can everyone find you? Uh, on Twitter, Verges Francois, my last name, my first name. And then on my website, samphionetworks.com. Uh, I actually published a couple of articles on crack this week. So you can go to samphionetworks.com slash blog. Um, yeah, very useful uh, videos from Mojo Networks that explains everything in details. Uh, also link to the research paper. If you are, if you feel like you want to read the, the paper, it gets all the details from uh, the researcher. And um, I believe you also wrote a little blog article yep. about I, crack. I wrote a, a small blog article, kind of focused more towards people who don't fully understand what this even means. So I didn't try to include a lot of technical detail. I try to answer some of the basic questions that we answered in this episode. And you can find that at packet6.com slash blog. You can find me on Twitter at Rowell Dionisio. And of course, you can find both me and Fritz on, on Twitter through the Clear to Send Twitter account. So once again, thank you guys for listening. If you have any questions, head over to the show notes. This is going to be clear to send.net slash 94. We're quickly approaching episode number 100. So that's nice. That's, that's going to be a big thing for us, but uh, we appreciate you guys listening to the show. Uh, appreciate all the feel feedback. And if there's anything you guys want to hear from us or any topics you guys want to maybe join on the, the, the show and talk about, just let us know. And we will see you guys on the next episode. Thank you. See you guys.